This is something of an unusual math video that I'm doing. It's, I think, the first one that I've yet done that was actually the result of a suggestion in the comments of another one of my videos. The suggestion was to solve the Schrodinger equation on a Mobius strip. I looked it up and apparently it has something to do with the movie Endgame, which I've never seen before. But whatever, it's a fun problem. I told this person that I didn't know when I'd get around to it, but it sort of stuck in my head. It's really a cool idea for a Schrodinger equation problem. So I actually got to solving it sooner than I was expecting to, and here's the video showing how to do that. How to solve the Schrodinger equation for a quantum particle on a Mobius strip. So let's get started with solving the Schrodinger equation on a Mobius strip. Here's a table of contents covering the breakdown of what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to have an introduction to the problem. I'm going to establish the boundary conditions for the problem, solve the free Schrodinger equation, impose the boundary conditions in several steps, and then present the complete result at the end all put together. Of course, the complete result will show up in pieces in this section as we derive it, but then I'll put it all together just so it's in one place and you can see it. It's kind of a pretty thing to see. When the word Mobius strip is mentioned, people usually picture what can be made from a strip of paper by twisting one end once and then attaching it to the other end. Something with a curved geometry, the classic Mobius strip topology, and that is embedded in 3D space. This, however, is actually more specific than is required to meet the definition of a Mobius strip. A Mobius strip is actually defined by its topology, not its geometry. So by requiring it be within the specific class of geometry, geometries you're thinking about when you're considering the paper twisted one and requiring it to be embedded in three-dimensional space is not relevant. Only the topology resulting from the twist is needed for it to be a Mobius strip by definition. As a result of this, in this video on solving the Schrodinger equation for a particle confined to a Mobius strip, I pick the easiest geometry that a space with Mobius strip topology can have, namely a flat space with Mobius strip boundary conditions, and I don't bother to embed it in anything. This, of course, differs from the curved geometry of a Mobius strip that one might make out of paper. The selected geometry, not just the topology alone, has the potential to change the energy eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. As a result, Result, technically, solving the Schrodinger equation in a Mobius strip is an ambiguous request. I therefore just selected, as I said, the easiest Mobius strip geometry to make the math simpler and to isolate the effect of the topology. It is probably worth noting that one can go even further with this. If one embeds a Mobius strip in three dimensions and confines a quantum particle to move on the 2D Mobius strip hypersurface, then one can have 3D quantum spin on this particle despite the fact that it is confined to move only on an embedded two-dimensional surface. The presence of 3D quantum spin on a 2D Mobius strip raises difficult questions about spin flipping given the topology of the Mobius strip. So now that we've figured out what kind of problem we need to solve, Let's get started solving it. The first step is to establish the boundary conditions. As with any potential where the wave function must go to zero abruptly, for example, the infinite potential well, and where the potential is zero in any region where the wave function is not expected to be zero, the potential function only affects the physics by imposing boundary conditions on the otherwise free wave function. Here, the edges of the Mobius strip are boundary conditions of this type. These first column boundary conditions here are what I'm talking about, and they just reflect the fact that the electron is not allowed to leave the Mobius strip. The remaining boundary conditions, the ones that make it a Mobius strip instead of, say, a cylinder, actually come from carefully selecting the continuity of the wave function and its first derivative as it stretches around the strip. Specifically, these considerations yield these second column boundary conditions. The derivative boundary condition is actually not necessary for determination of the energy eigenvalues. Normally, it would be relevant to fixing an otherwise arbitrary constant in the wave function. In the case of the Mobius strip, it yields a redundant equation that doesn't fix anything. This is therefore an extra arbitrary parameter in the wave function that actually reflects an infinite degeneracy arising from invariance under translation in the x direction. With our boundary conditions established, we must now solve the free Schrodinger equation in 2D flat space so that we have a general wave function on which to impose our boundary conditions. Doing this is, of course, easiest in Cartesian coordinates, so the two-dimensional flat free space Schrodinger equation in Cartesian coordinates is this partial differential equation. It's very recognizable. This is separable 
So we will use separation of variables. Our separation on sides is the usual one. Inserting this and separating variables proceeds as follows. So I've just inserted it. And then what I've done is I've recognized that you can pull out the factor that does not depend on the variable with respect to which you're differentiating. And what's left is a total derivative of the remaining factor. After that, I divided by both factors, giving this. Then I separated variables, meaning I pulled all the things that depend on a given variable to a different side than all the terms that depend on the other variable. Each side of this equation is exclusively dependent on a different variable, so both must be equal to constants, which is where I get this thing from. Then I can pull off these two equations, and these are easy to solve because they're just the equation for the classic simple harmonic oscillator. We're familiar with it. We know they're just solved by sines and cosines, aka complex exponentials. But here I didn't find any particular use to expressing it as complex exponentials, so I just wrote it out explicitly as sines and cosines, giving us these two solutions here. Now that we have both the x and the y boundary conditions and our general free space solution, all that remains is to impose these boundary conditions on the free space solution. Doing this will give us the complete Schrodinger equation wave function on a Mobius strip, and it will also give us the energy eigenvalues. The easiest boundary conditions to impose are these ones, because they only involve a change in one variable. It turns out it's also easier to do these first, because having this part figured out when we try and impose the second boundary condition is useful. So this boundary condition, because it only involves a change in one variable, implies this boundary condition for the upsilon factor, which was the purely y-dependent factor. And there are actually two ways to satisfy this boundary condition. So we'll have two separate cases. First, we could select the coefficient of y, the argument, namely this quantity, to be a value such that the cosine part alone satisfies this boundary condition. This would correspond to this selection of the value. And the reason why that's true is because if we plug this value or that value in, the ly will cancel the ly in the denominator and deliver a factor of 2 in the denominator, turning this quantity into the roots of cosine. Therefore, the boundary conditions are satisfied. The unfortunate part is that cosines and sines do not have any of the same roots. So this thing actually is not the roots of sine, and none of the sine roots are the roots of the cosine. So in order for this solution overall to satisfy the boundary conditions completely, if we select the value of this quantity to be this, we have to set the coefficient on sine to be zero so that that part doesn't interfere at all. And the fact that this only works with the cosine part, therefore, is OK, because there's no sine part anymore. So for the first case, which I denote epsilon i, this is the y part of the wave function. Now we can take this relation here and solve for the energy for this case 1, and we get partial determination of the energy eigenvalues for case 1. This, of course, is incomplete because we still don't know a, and also we're ignoring case 2. So let's move on to case 2. Similarly, we could have also selected the value of this quantity to be such that the sine part of the wave function satisfied the boundary conditions. And that would correspond to this selection, which is true because these are the roots of sine. You plug this in, the ly's cancel. And the factor of 2 in the denominator cancels the factor of 2 in the numerator, leaving you with just the roots of sine left over. However, of course, as I said, the roots of sine are also not the roots of cosine. So we have to zero out the cosine part by picking the coefficient c to be 0 for case 2. Therefore, our case 2 epsilon part of the wave function, the y-dependent part, is this. Again, we can use this relationship to solve for the energy for case 2, and we get a similarly incomplete result because it doesn't include case 1, and we also don't know what a is. And a will depend on which case we're talking about. To figure out a for the two cases, we need the second boundary condition. To impose a second boundary condition here, because it involves changes in both variables, we need to impose it on the entire wave function at the same time. And therefore, this actually just implies this. We can't just separate off the x part. So case 1 involves starting with these wave function components and these partially unspecified energy eigenvalues. These are the boundary conditions we've got. Plugging the wave function pieces in gets us here. We can then remember that cosine is even, and therefore this minus sign can be taken away, which gets us to this. We can then divide out common factors, which gets us here. Then this should be true equally for all x. 
and if we prove it for one particular value of x, it should be good for all the others, given that everything else other than x here is a constant. So we're free to take x equal to 0 and simplify our math, which gives us this relation. If this is to be true, this cosine needs to be 1, and this sine needs to be 0 always, which is only true for this value of root a. Ignoring the factor of 2 would still satisfy the sine equals 0 part, but it would not always satisfy the cosine equals 1 part. Sometimes cosine would equal minus 1, specifically for every other integer. Therefore, the factor of 2 is necessary to guarantee that the cosine condition is also satisfied simultaneously. Plugging this into the energy eigenvalues gives us this complete result for the case 1 energy eigenvalues, and the complete eigenfunctions are just this. I just move some constants around to make it look nicer and more formal. N is the normalization constant, and phi is the arbitrary constant I mentioned in the boundary condition section, the one that results from translation invariance in the x direction. It's easy to show that the derivative boundary condition doesn't fix this like you'd normally think, simply by plugging things in. So plugging the wave function pieces in gets us here. Again, we remember that cosine is even, so we can get rid of the minus sign, and we can take x to be equal to 0 for the same reason as above. Evaluating sines and cosines and dividing things out ultimately gets us to phi equals phi, which is satisfied for every value. It is, in fact, arbitrary. The same thing can be done on the second part wave function once we get it. It works out exactly the same. Now let's impose this second boundary condition on the second case wave function. Here we're working with these two wave function pieces and these incompletely specified energy eigenvalues. This is the same boundary condition we were working with above. If we plug in the wave function pieces, we get this. Then we can remember that sine is an odd function here and take x to be equal to zero. That gets us to this. If we divide out common factors, we get from here to here. Now this equation is only true if we have this value for cosine and this value for sine. Now these are only simultaneously always the case if we select this value for root a. Doing that causes both of these equations to be satisfied simultaneously for all integers l. We can then plug that back in and we get this energy eigenvalue. These are the complete case 2 energy eigenvalues. And just like we did for case 1, we can also write out the complete case 2 energy eigenfunctions here, where again, this is an arbitrary parameter, which again will not be fixed by the derivative boundary condition. The check for that goes exactly like the one that I did for case one. Therefore, the complete beautiful solution to the Schrodinger equation on a Mobius strip is this. These are the energy eigenvalues, and these are the energy eigenfunctions. So now you know how to solve the Schrodinger equation for a quantum particle on a Mobius strip. If somebody asks you, and you say you don't know how to do it, you are now lying. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.